Hi, and welcome to the Business Revolution podcast. My name is Rob Yates, and together with Mark Hopkins, we're going to be bringing you a special guest today, a guest that we are delighted to interview. Have you ever thought about how to wash a chicken? Some of us might have, probably most of us haven't. And this is what we're going to discuss in this podcast with Professor Tim Colkins. We are going to discuss the core principles and philosophies of marketing. What is marketing? What's the value of marketing? How do you market? We'll also discuss how to wash a chicken. This podcast is sponsored by the Tetraki Business Secrets Club, our free membership program with no catches, no credit cards, no commitments. But you can go and join and receive over £20,000 of business coaching every year for free. You can simply join by visiting www.tetrakey.com and clicking the link in the homepage of the website or clicking the link in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's move forwards into this amazing podcast. In this podcast, we bring you people who are going to make you sit bolt upright. You know the time when you're at school and you're slouching on your chair and the headmaster walks in and you sit bolt bolt right up. This is exactly what's going to happen today. You are going to be hugged. You're going to be patted on the back. And I'm pretty sure you're going to get a little bit of a box on the nose because we have an award-winning marketing professor. We always try and bring you people who... uh, First and foremost, from a purely selfish reason, I am just intrigued to spend time with. And Tim Culkins is exactly that kind of person. He is an author, consultant, speaker. He is the clinical professor of marketing at Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management and has probably the biggest and most important job in any uh, society which is around driving a marketing strategy. He consults with leading organizations around the world and is an author of multiple books, which we're going to go into, especially his latest book, which launches, I believe, in five days' time called How to Wash a Chicken, which I cannot wait to get into. Professor Culkins, thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait to be punched, hugged, and probably slapped around the face over the next hour. Oh, well, thank you. It's great to be uh, here and great to be part of the podcast. So first and foremost, um, why should we all care about marketing? Well, it's important to start with the fact that we are all marketers. Uh, You know, everybody is a marketer. It's not just the domain of the advertising executives and the brand managers. Marketing is at the core all about connecting ideas, connecting products, connecting services with, with people's needs. And finding a way to take your ideas and your products and your services and connecting it with what people care about and what they're looking for. And we all do that in in different ways. You know, the big companies do it. So if you look at Coca-Cola or you look at Apple or the big companies, you know, they clearly do it because they've got products to sell. But but we all do it because at work every day, we come to work and, and we try to contribute and we try to meet the needs of the people around us, the boss and uh, the people we work with. And, and in a way, that's a marketing job. And we also get involved in it when we think about, you know, getting involved at our at our kid's school and, and we get involved there or the, or the sports team and we get involved there. And in a way, we're all trying to have an impact on the world. And if we're going to have an impact on the world, we've got to find a way to connect with what other people are looking for. And that's really what marketing is all about. I love how you've just described that as well. Um, and it's such a powerful world connection. Um, and especially, and we'll, we'll talk later around societal impacts, but um, how the world is at the moment where we're, we're the most connected we've ever been. But if you read so many stats and data, we're probably the most lonely we've ever been as well. How do you reconcile that difference? Well, there's always been a, 
you know, difference in, in marketing uh, between reaching people and connecting with people. So, you know, if you think about it, if you think about a piece of advertising, most advertising, you know, we don't like it. We, we try to avoid it. You're like, you're, you're breaking into my life here. You're <laughs> keeping me from the show that I want to watch. And, and so what's happening there is we're, we're getting to people, but we're not connecting with them in a way that they care about. It's, it's not important for them. You know, if, if it's done very well, you know, the advertising is different. We actually like it. It's helpful. We want to watch it. We maybe go back and watch it again. And I think what happens now, if you look at social media, if you look at all of the ways people communicate now, is it's very easy to reach people, and yet it's hard to connect with people. Hmm. See, on social media, you can get out there and post this and post that, and people might like it and what have you, but are you really connecting with people? And that's a different thing. I worry sometimes that as we bring up kids, we are teaching kids how to how to you know reach people, but we're not really teaching them how do you connect on a on a deeper level, and I think that's maybe a gap as you think about how young people are coming up these days. Yeah, you're you're a father like like I'm a father, um, and I think yeah I, I'm fascinated. I'd love to actually spend a bit of time talking about this because I think it's we we separate our lives out so much in terms of a working persona, a social persona, a a family persona, but what you've just articulated there is the one thing that really pulls all those three personas together is, is connection, is marketing. Um, I'm just interested from you personally in terms of is Professor Culkins, when he's teaching execs in his MBA program, is he marketing different than when he's with his children? Well, it's, I, they're both sort of marketing challenges. So, you know, I began my career at Kraft Foods and I was marketing brands like Parquet Margarine and Miracle Whip and all of that. And when you're marketing those brands and you're trying to figure out the promotion plans and the advertising plans, you're really trying to think about how do you get people to, to pick up this stuff and how do you get them to make the potato salad or the sandwich? And what's interesting is as a parent though, you know, very often you sort of face the same issues. It, it is... It's so interesting. You know, you're, you're, you're my son, uh, Charlie. You know, some days you come home and there he is sitting on the couch on, you know, and I'm just looking at his computer or something. And, 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 and the question is, how do you get Charlie or Anna, the, the young one, uh, my youngest daughter, you know, how do you, how do you get them doing what you think they should be doing? Yeah. And the interesting thing is you can't just tell them to do it. It, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Just like, you can't tell someone to buy Miracle Whip. They're not going to do it. They're going to get annoyed at you. It's the same thing with your kids. You tell them to go do something, they're just going to get annoyed. The question is, how do you come up with it? How do you make it in their interest? How do you shape it? How do you position it, if you will, to get them to do what you think they should be doing? That's really a marketing task more than it's parenting. But parenting and marketing, you know, there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah, I think there's a, it's a massive amount of overlap. And I think it's... Um... It's an area that we forget a little bit because, again, we do a lot of work with small business owners. Um, and the main question they ask us is around marketing. And, and they find the concept of marketing so difficult and so challenging. What, why, do you find, um, why do you find that people have this, this perception of marketing being so difficult? Is it because we, we look at it through simple, too many simple eyes, such as I just need to come up with a logo? Well, why do you find that? Well, I, I would sort of point to three things. Uh, one is, you know, marketing is complicated these days because there are just so many different things we can do, and a lot of them are complicated to, to figure out. I mean, I mean, now you go on, on social media and you get on Facebook and you try to start putting together a marketing campaign on Facebook, for example. It's just complicated. You know, you've got to think about how do you, how do you set that up? How do you read it, all of that, it's just there's complexity all around. So one thing that makes marketing tough is executionally, it's complicated. How do you figure out all the different vehicles and how do you put those things together? The, uh, this, the, the second reason though it's complicated is that uh, it, 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 it's very hard to figure out uh, how do you influence people. Hmm. And you know, one of the challenges with marketing is that you can't just ask somebody, you know, you can't go and say, you know, well, what do you want? What do you want to see? What can I tell you to get you to behave? I want you to behave. You know, that's never going to, that's never going to work. I mean, it's like when you're dealing with your spouse, perhaps, you know, and sometimes 
you're like, you know, your spouse is like, you know, on a Friday night, you're like, well, where do you want to go for dinner, honey? Or what do you want to do? And they just get mad at you. And you're like, what the <laughs> heck? I mean, I'm just trying to, and, and clearly you did something wrong earlier in the day or something <laughs> else is going on, but, but they're, what's happening is they're mad at you. You don't know why they're mad at you. And, and, and you can't even ask them why they're mad at you because they're like, you should already know this. In marketing, <laughs> often like that. You go to your customers and you say, how do I get you to buy my product? And they can't tell you. They don't know. It's hard to figure out what people are, what's motivating people because often they don't even know what's motivating them. And, and people make decisions in such complicated ways. It's really, it's really tricky. The third thing that about marketing that's hard is that it can be very hard to, to evaluate our results. And, and, and that's particularly challenging. Are we are we really breaking through here or are we not breaking through? You know, the stuff we can measure, so we can measure web traffic and we can measure conversion from an email to a purchase sometimes. I mean, these things we can measure, but it's very hard to measure. Am I really connecting with somebody? Am I resonating with someone? Am I building uh, loyalty? Am I building connection? That's not easy to measure that stuff. And so what's hard in marketing is some of the most important stuff that we should be doing is some of the stuff that's really tough to measure. And that's another thing that makes it really hard. I, I think what makes marketing fun is that it is so hard and it's complicated. It's also <laughs> important. It's really, it's sort of key to success for small businesses, big businesses, individuals, but it's not an easy task. Now I'm seeing, um, especially in corporates as well, you used to have the sales function as the, the poster boy of the business, driving the business, um, and marketing almost being the lapdog to the sales functions. Um, and I'm seeing a big shift at the moment where heads of sales are now reporting into the head of marketing. How, how do you see those trends changing or driving over the next few years? Well, you know, organizations are structured uh, differently and they run sort of differently. At some companies, historically, it has been sales driven. And then marketing has very much been in a support role, uh, creating marketing material, supporting the sales force. What do you need to be successful? All of that. Other organizations have run with more marketing at the lead. And then sales is almost at a support role. And, and, and that's driven by cultural factors, business dynamics, different things uh, set, that, set that up. What I think is changing now, though, for, for everybody, is that communication is, is changing. Mm. And that's changing for, for big companies, small companies, B2B, B2C. What's happening now is with the rise of digital communications, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the sales team and the sales channel controls just a small part of the communication flow now. I think it used to be that you know, sales was at the lead. And when you were interacting with a customer, it was primarily a customer and a salesperson working together. Now what's happening is customers can get information from so many places. And very often the first thing they're going to do is go and start searching online when it comes time to buy a product. And so all of a sudden now you've got to think about a lot more points of contact. And it's really not just a sales task anymore. I mean, sales is still super important. But now you've got to be thinking much more broadly. So even the companies that were very sales driven, I think now are going to pivot because they're going to have to pivot and they're going to start thinking more broadly about what is our brand? What is our value proposition? How do we make sure that's getting out there? And how do we lay the groundwork for the sales organization? So when the salesperson shows up, the customer is going to be ready to, ready to buy. Yes, it goes, as you said, it goes back to that, that connecting connecting with your potential customer and and it connect, connecting i think at a level that we've never had to connect at ever in the past because i think we're obviously as consumers we're much more fussy we have access to more information so many more reviews um and again i think if i look at um we had a great podcast with a guy called brandon peel who talks about purpose um and how are we connecting as a brand with a consumer's purpose, because that, that's at the core of who we are. How, would, how do companies get over that challenge of, of connecting with purpose? Well, the way I like to think of it is ultimately what you want to do at a company is you want to offer your customers, you want to create 
you know, customer advantage. The way I define that, and, and we define it here, here at the Kellogg School, is to say you've got a benefit that people care about, they're willing to pay for, and they see you as best at providing it. And if you have customer advantage, everything's good, right? Because then we've got a, a service or a product that people care about. They're going to pay us for it. I can get a good price. I can get good margin. Life is great. If I don't have it, I'm in a really tough spot because now I'm forced to compete on, on price. Now, the thing about building customer advantage, though, is that it comes from giving customers really important benefits. And I think for any company, any offering service product, it's really about that. Do we have a benefit for the customer that we can own and that they care about? And the, the higher order that benefit, so the bigger the benefit, the more they're going to pay for it, the more significant it is. You know, when you think about why do people spend money in the way they do? And why do they buy products they do? Usually it's not because there's a particular little feature they care about. That's not it. It's because the product is connecting to a much bigger benefit, a much bigger purpose in their, in their life, if you will. So as you push higher and higher, you get to more significant things. Big watch out, of course, you got to be careful that the linkage is still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you can push purpose too far if you're not careful. You go to somebody and say, you know what, I'm selling a pencil here. And, uh, you know, and this pencil is going to save the world. And people will look at you and they'll be like, it's just a pencil, you know? <laughs> and, and, and so you can easily lose people if you're not careful. But if you push up, I mean, and I think this is what people should really think about. How do we find a benefit that our customer really cares about? If we can tap into that, you know, then we've, then we've, uh, then we've got it. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting angle to look at because obviously what, and again, everyone talks about, and I find this quite a, it's such a flippant statement, putting the customer at the heart of everything we do. You see, you hear so many organizations talk about this and practically but not many follow through because they're still driven by profit. They're still driven by shareholder returns. Um, and interesting what you're saying there is, is and I, again, if you take it back to small businesses when they do social media marketing or anything, or even building up a brand, all they're looking at is the number of likes that they've had on a photo rather than, the connection or, or the engagement, what has what you've put out into the market, how has that hooked that customer rather than how has that generated something straight away? Yeah, I think it's, it's important to, to keep in mind. There's a big difference between, you know, likes. This is the problem in marketing, I think, today in a way, uh, because, you know, a lot of the metrics we get are not great metrics, but they're the metrics we have. So you look at, for example, you put a photo out on something and, and you get a lot of likes and you're like, well, that I guess is awesome. That's terrific. But, but in reality, that doesn't mean much of anything in a way, uh, you know, so I put a nice picture out of a cute cat, you know, and a lot of people like cats and I'll probably get a lot <laughs> of likes on that, but that probably doesn't do anything for my business or my, or my you know, what it's not doing, it's not really necessarily connecting with what the customers care about, the benefits for them. And, and I think that's the important thing to remember. No, I have not agree. And I think it's an interesting topic to start talking a little bit about is obviously societal impacts and societal changes that we've seen over the last five, 10 years. And um, what kind of societal impacts um, should we be thinking about that influences uh, how we market our business? I think there's so many things you have to be aware of and, and, and thinking about, and, and they touch different things. So, I mean, the simplest is that when you're putting together marketing right now, you need to be familiar with all the new platforms that are out there, all the new ways to connect with people. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we wrote a book, uh, Kellogg on Branding, and that came out in 2000. And 2005, 2006. What's amazing, though, we went back looking at that book uh, about a year ago. And, and what's amazing in the book, right? And you look at the index, there is not in the index, right? We do not have Google. We do not have mm -hmm. Amazon. We do not have Facebook. We do not have Twitter. All of these tools are totally new. I mean, now we're back, we're doing a new version of the book because you know you cannot talk about marketing these days without talking about these new platforms that are out there. So the first thing is that if you're going to be successful in marketing, you've got to be familiar with, you've got to be using the tools that are available. You know, the world of TV and print is 
is it's still there, but it is not not what it used to be, and certainly it's fading away. And and I think that's certainly important. The 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 more complicated thing, though, is to try to think about what's important to people today and how are their desires, interests, motivations shifting. And what the data tells you is that when you think about what's important for people, you really do see some changes in, in, in the world. You know, young people, uh, as, as people come along more and more, it's about thinking about bigger things, thinking about, well, thinking about purpose, thinking about it's not just the product. It's how do I feel good about this product? Do I feel good mm-hmm. about this brand and what it's doing? That's a, that's a change. And then you have the whole idea kicking around, which is this whole idea of sort of minimalism. And this whole idea that maybe we don't need to buy anything anymore, and maybe we can live with less stuff. And that's a really interesting idea to think about that's out there. And as a marketer, what you really want to do is just constantly be listening to try to figure out what's motivating people, how are they making decisions. And then the hardest part is to say, well, how does that then interact and intersect with my product or service? You know, you don't want to blindly chase after trends. That's not going to get you anywhere. But you do want to say, all right, well, what is important for people and how is that affecting how I'm talking about all of my offerings, how I'm trying to connect with them, and how do I incorporate that? And if you can do that, then you get to a really strong pitch when you're taking it to customers. Yeah, and that's those those questions are such power questions. And too often we 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 see people just jumping on the first, like you said, jumping on like the first trend that they see and and blindly going, we'll, we'll talk later on about some practical things around investment strategies and marketing, but they just blindly start um, where, where the noisiest trend is at the moment, not really thinking about that, how that aligns to, to their specific target market and or their brand. Yeah. And, and you know, and to be honest, the, the industry, I think, feeds this uh, a little bit. So I think what happens is, you know, you get a lot of marketing agencies out there and, and marketing companies. And of course, they love to talk about the new stuff. And the impact of that was for a lot of companies, and especially smaller companies, they end up working with these agencies. And the agencies are all talking about is just the latest trend, the latest thing. And it can easily get you know, hooked a little bit that way which is just a watch out. You want to be sure that, yes, you got to be listening, but you always have to ask the question of, at the end of the day, does this really go back to my product and service? And does it really go back to my customers and helping me meet their needs? Yeah, we actually, we did a, a test with um, a company. Uh, and again, if I look at, just as we, we, we you touched there on actually marketing companies, marketing agencies, we went, with, went to them with a, a pretty specific request about what we wanted, which was, uh, a volume number, uh, and we basically said budget uh, wasn't uh, an issue. We just want the volume, um, and they were very proud because they came back to us around cost per acquisition, um, and they were saying they've got such a good cost per acquisition. But we were saying, well, yes, but your numbers are so small. But but their metrics, they were driven so much by their metrics, they actually didn't understand what we as a customer wanted from them. I think that's where I'm, I see a lot of the trends, especially with marketing agencies at the moment, who are, as you said at the start, uh, we're not blessed at the moment with really good metrics to help drive it. And we get blinded by hitting the, co- the lowest price per acquisition we can rather than actually listening to customer needs. Yeah. Well, and one of the things we see more and more in marketing now, and, and I think it's becoming more and more important, is trying to make sure you've got the right uh, customers. And which is tricky because cost per acquisition just says, let's get some people in the door and figure Mm -hmm. how much it it costs us to get them in there. But now the way the world's working now, it is so important to make sure you're getting the right people. It's not just getting people, it's getting the right people. Because what happens is if you get the right person to deal with your company or your service, what's going to happen is they're going to have, you know, a good experience. They're going to appreciate what you do. They're going to value it. They're going to... benefit from it. And then what's going to happen is two good things. They're going to be loyal to you over time. And then they're going to go out and recruit other people. And they're going to recruit other people that are probably going to like you too. And it's awesome if you get the right people. Now you get the wrong people. What's going to happen? Well, the problem is they're not going to be that happy. They're not going to get a lot of value. They're going to walk away saying, yeah, it wasn't so great. And they're not going to say good things about you out there in social media. In a way, you've got to be very careful, like who's the right person. 
I had a, one of my cousins ran a cooking school in France at one point. And, and, uh, you know, and I asked her about the cooking school and I was like, how's it going? And she's like, well, you know, we got ups and downs, but she says, you know, one of the most important things we've learned is that we've got to get the right people to our cooking school. And, and, and what, what was happening was that when people think of going to a cooking school in France, Sometimes they think of high cuisine, you know, the Cordon Bleu, the, the Ritz, the very Alec. And, and that's not what, they, what she had. I mean, she was very much more traditional, uh, southern France, country cooking, very delicious, very real, very authentic, very organic. But it was not, it was not Le Cordon Bleu. So the problem was if she got the wrong people into her cooking class, they were going to just be totally unhappy. You know, it's not enough to get people these days. You got to get the right people. And that's just so fundamentally important. Yeah, it's, as you say, it's about being brave to say sometimes no to certain clients and customers because they're just not a right fit for you. Yeah. Well, um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I love what you said at the start when you talked about marketing. You, you said um, you love it because it is so hard and complex. Um, what, what fascinated you about marketing to make it a, a career for you? Uh, so I started in, in, in marketing really when I got out of uh, business school. Uh, when I was in business school, I was thinking about what, you know, what I should do when I got out. And, uh, and, and eventually I decided, my analysis was, and I think it's still right, is that in the world of business, if you're going to be successful, you have to be good at one of three things, right? You have to be good at either financing things or making things or selling things. Yeah. And and, and then I looked at it and I said, I'm not going to be a finance person. I'm not really a finance guy at the core. Operations, I'm not an engineer. I don't want to spend my life in a manufacturing side of things. So, so I've got to be in the world of selling then, sales and marketing. I think marketing sounds more interesting. So, so then I said, shoot, let's go give it a go. So I went to Kraft Foods and I was there for 11 years working on all sorts of different brands. I sort of worked my way up the ranks. Uh, I started on craft salad dressing. I went to parquet margarine. I went to Miracle Whip. I, and then you bounce your way along there uh, as, as you go. But as I got into it, you know, I really appreciated the the uh, the interest. You know, the the complexity of it, the interest in it. I thought it was just a terrific field. I really enjoyed it, uh, and it was so it was just fascinating. And that's what really hooked me on it because I could see when it worked, and then I could see when it didn't work. And it was so fun to try to figure out what's going to work. And, and that was just fascinating. It's great. It's a great line of work. Yeah. Again, it's that element of fun. I think sometimes we forget, again, there's lots of things about getting up, going to work, um, coming home, just feeling drudgery all the time. And I think having that, building a career around first and foremost fun is, is a great way. Um, so what, what made you move from sort of the corporate space into academia and, and, and the consulting world that you, that you both play in now? And yeah, so uh, what happened was I, I grew up in a family of teachers, uh, by and large, and I always thought it'd be fun to teach. So when I was at Kraft, I said, you know, boy, it'd be sort of fun to teach after I'd been at Kraft now for a number of years, five, six years. Uh, I knew someone at Kraft. I heard that there was somebody there who was teaching at one of the local business schools. So I went and I talked to her and I said, what's that about? And she said, oh yeah, she did it in the evening as sort of an adjunct faculty member. And you could do it, a lot of work, but you could do it. And then she said, you know what? She had just gotten called from somebody who was looking for a person to teach this advertising class. And this was at a school called Keller uh, uh, School of Business. Anyway, so I call over there and indeed they're looking for somebody to teach this advertising class. And I try to do a little uh, interview and all. And I start doing that in the evening. Just as a side uh, side thing, I do that for a number of years teaching advertising there. Then I had a friend who was at, at Kellogg at Northwestern, where, where I actually am today. And he said, you know, that's great, but you really should be teaching at Kellogg instead of at Keller. <laughs> and I said, well, that would be awesome. So then I they needed someone right at that time to teach a marketing strategy course. So I shifted over and I started doing that as an adjunct just on the side. Then what happened was I'd been at Kraft then for about 11 years. And... Uh, and, uh, and I thought that I wasn't learning very much anymore. It seemed a lot of, you know, another year, another marketing plan, another product. Uh, and I also did the analysis, quite honestly. I said, you know, what's the chance that I'm going to be CEO of Kraft? Hmm. Because I decided that if I was going to be CEO, then I should stick around because that would be awesome. You know, you get the plane, the big bucks, all of that. But then I decided the chance of my being CEO was zero. 
uh, for all sorts of reasons. It's never gonna, there's never going to be CEO of that company. So, so then I said, you know, it's probably time to go. Uh, but right at that moment, Kellogg wanted me to teach more courses. So I said to Kellogg, you know, heck, if you would make me a clinical faculty member, that means you get a salary in an office. They w- that I would jump over, and so they said okay. And uh, so then I then I jumped over, and uh, uh, so after eleven years at Kraft, I left that. I came over to the academic world. Uh, uh, my salary went down by about ninety percent in the process. <laughs> and uh, but the model was I'd spend a third of my time teaching, a third of my time consulting, and a third of my time speaking and writing. And that was sort of the model when I came over and uh, and started up at the university. And haven't regretted it since. Well, no, and that's been now quite a long time ago. That's been now, uh, what was it, 16 years ago I did that. Yes. Uh, and, it's been, uh, and it's been terrific. It is so different. You know, the academic world is so different than, than working in a company. But it's been terrific. You know, the students are super fun. I really like what I do on a day-to-day basis. It's, uh, it's challenging. Uh, but when it works, it's, it's, uh, it's great. Well, let's, let's start talking about, obviously, you articulated your, your model, your third, third, third. Um, and part of one of your third is your is your writing, um, and there's a, a number of books you've written. We'll we'll spend a bit of time in a second on your latest book. Uh, but I'm just fascinated around um, your breakthrough marketing plans, um, and you talk there about the time wasting that we do and not not focusing on driving growth. Um, what do you see most people wasting their time on? Well, marketing plans are so important because they're really the heart for any business. You, know, you want to have a marketing plan. You want to have very clear direction. What am I doing? Where am I spending my money? What are my priorities? And so the plan is really important. The problem, though, is if you look at a lot of marketing plans, and this is true all around the world, what you see is people get so lost in all the data and all the analysis and all the information. And you know, they never really get around to saying, here are the priorities, here's the things to focus on. Where they really get lost is, is the section of the marketing plan that's called the situation analysis. Hmm. And, and that ends up being this massive data dump, you know, because we have so much information now that if we're not careful, what we do is we just throw all that information into this situation analysis. And, and the problem is that the situation analysis doesn't really add a lot of value unless you get to the thing that does add value and that's setting the priorities, making the choices you've got to make, laying out the direction, being clear, what are we going to go do? So in, in, the, in the, the Breakthrough Marketing Plans book that I have, what I really advocate for and recommend is that people you know, really skip that situation analysis section completely. And what they do is they spend the marketing plan laying out, here's what we're going to go do, Here's why we think this is going to work, why this is a good idea, and here's how we're going to make it happen. Cool. Well, we'll, um, we'll touch base in a second on, on some of those practical things for all sides businesses. But let's, let's focus for a bit on it's, it's five days' time, isn't it? September the 25th, um, how to wash a, a chicken comes out. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to ask the obvious question in a second around the title, but I just thought... As I, as I looked at the title, it brought me back to a story, and it's, um, I just thought I'd share my, my parenting story. So um, I sat down with my son. He must have been five or six at the time, and we were reading a book which was titled Why Did the Chicken Cross the Road? And um, I was flicking through, and each page was a different uh, picture and a story around a chicken and stuff. And we came to one page, which was a picture of these, this chicken playing baseball. And the picture of the was a baseball with a window smashed with obviously the ball having gone through the window. So I, I saw, looked at this, this page and I thought, fantastic, this is a great opportunity for a parenting lesson. So I sat down with my boy and I was like, boy, if you break a glass when you're playing sport, what, what should you do? And he just turned and he looked at me with a complete level of seriousness and he goes, Daddy, if I break a glass, I've got to run. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I read it about your, the title of your book, it just took me straight back to that moment of my son saying that he should run. I didn't know whether to be proud of him or, or scold him for not owning up to breaking the window. Very nice. You appreciate the honesty, though. <laughs> exactly. I loved it. Yeah. They're the marketer in making their straightaway. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, how, how to wash chicken? Where let's where where did the title come from? And 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 obviously the books around mastering the business presentation. So yeah, you know, give us an overview of the book. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so so my new book is all around how do you create and put together and deliver a, a great business presentation. Uh, you know, there's three ideas, three sort of insights behind the book. Uh, one is that presenting is so important uh, for anybody in, in business. If you're going to be a business leader, you really have to be able to create and deliver good presentations. It is fundamental to how we make decisions. You know, it's interesting as we communicate now more and more with chat and with Slack and with all these different platforms. That's all great. But at the end of the day, when it comes time to make a decision, People are still sitting down and saying, let's go through the decision, let's go through the logic, let's go through this presentation. I think it's a fundamental skill for, for leaders, and you have to be able to do it. The second thing, though, is that what's amazing to me is how people really struggle uh, when it comes to presenting. You know, uh, you know people are get, get so nervous, and, and, and in many cases, people don't even, I think, know how to, know how to do it. Uh, and I see this in my students here at Kellogg at the business school. You know, they are incredibly motivated. They're incredibly smart. They're, they're amazing people. But they write very often just these terrible presentations. And the reason they do that is because they just, they just don't know. Uh, a lot of times people just don't know how to do it. The third thing, though, is that there aren't, and I haven't seen great resources out there to really help people very practically think about and put together how do you put together a good business update. And, and the book is really designed to do that. It's a super practical book that's all about step-by-step, step, let's go through how do we put together a great business presentation. And that's what the book is really all about. It's aimed, I guess, at two audiences, either people who are starting out on their career and looking to figure this out and uh, trying to figure out how do you write a great presentation. Also, there's an audience, though, which is senior people who are tired of reviewing presentations, perhaps, that aren't as tight as they could be. And this is a book they could use with their team, with their staff, so that all of a sudden they start looking at better presentations. If you get a pre better presentation, you're going to ultimately make better decisions. And that's what it's really all about. Oh, the title, though. You asked about the title. Yeah. Right, so the book was originally called, when I was first working on it, and if you look at the initial drafts, I think I called it, at first, Breakthrough Presentations to sort of match the Breakthrough Marketing Plans, my other book. Hmm. And then I changed it, and I changed it to The Art of the Business Presentation, I think, something like that. But then I gave it to a friend of mine and uh, asked him to read the book. And he read it. He said, you know, I like that book. It's a nice book. Uh, but you've got just the dullest title in the history of the world here. <laughs> he said, you know what? You've got to call this thing How to Wash a Chicken. Uh, you know, I have, I have a story in the book about washing a chicken. He's like, you know, just call it that. And I'm like, wow, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> life. You know, there's no way I'm calling it that. But then I kicked it around, I thought about it, and I ran it by some other people, and I was like, darn, that is a bit of a catchy title. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, I said, you know, heck with it, we're going with it. You know, there's a, there is a story in the book about washing a chicken. That's part of it. Also, it's a metaphor, right? So if, if you're taking a chicken to a chicken show, you've got to clean it up. You've got to wash the chicken. So the chicken looks good. You know, it's got to look its best. But it's the same thing in a company. If you've got an idea, a recommendation, you've got to clean it up so that it looks its best and that it comes across as well as it can. And so in a way, it works on a couple levels there. Uh, it does get people's attention, the title, though. It is, a, it is a different title out there in the world of business. So, so it's a sort of a fun title. And I think it's ultimately sort of a fun book. Practical, but fun. I think it's a brilliant title. Absolutely love it. Um, so obviously the, the book um, gives you practical tips around uh, around mastering the business presentation. But before we go into some of those tips, what are the some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen people make in in business presentations? Well, I highlight I think two. Uh, one is that. Very often people start writing a presentation, but they're not entirely clear about what's the goal of the presentation. And that is almost always going to be a problem because if you don't know the goal of the presentation, it's really hard to figure out how do you structure it? How do you lay it out? Uh, it, what you want, when, you want to, when you're doing a presentation, you want to begin by saying, okay, what's my job here? What's my task? And maybe I'm trying to sell a recommendation. Maybe I'm doing an update on a new product. Maybe I'm trying to get an investor. Maybe I'm trying to make my investor invest more money. 
maybe I'm trying to sell a, a pricing restructuring program, whatever it is, right? If, if I'm clear on that, it's going to help me a lot uh, to make sure that presentation really works. I actually recommend that before people do a presentation, they spend some time and they write a little presentation brief where they say, who am I presenting to? And what do I know about this person? And what am I trying to get across? And you know, how much time do I have? And what do they, and, and you've, if you start with that, you're going to end up with a much stronger presentation at the end of it. The other mistake I, th- I see people make very often is the whole process is wrong. What a lot of people will do is they say, okay, I got to do a, a presentation on pricing. All right, so let me gather up the information I have on pricing and then let me sort of put it in some sort of an order and that'll be my presentation. And that I would suggest is just totally the wrong, that's the totally wrong approach when it comes to creating a presentation. You want to instead say, wait a second, okay, what's my, what am I trying to do here? And then you want to spend your time and you want to say, well, what's the story here? Hmm. What's the, what's going on? How do I turn this into a, into a story? And, and you say, okay, well, let me figure out where do I begin in this presentation? And, and you're, you're going to start with a, a point of, of agreement, probably a point that your, your audience is familiar with. You might say, okay, well, last year, you know, we had a terrific year in terms of business results. Okay, great. We're all agreed now. All right, let's begin here. Now, what's the problem? Well, in the first quarter, right, we saw our sales begin to slow down. The trends have continued in the second quarter, right? And the reason they're slowing down is because we're seeing our competitors take some very aggressive actions. Our competitors are taking these actions because they're under a lot of financial pressure. And we think these actions are going to continue. Well, now, all of a sudden, I'm telling you the story. And if I can figure out that story, you know, then I can pop in the data, right? You want to start with the story. You don't start with the data. You start with the story. What are we trying to tell people? What's really happening? If you do that, you're going to end up with a really tight flow, a tight presentation. Yeah, it's, um, and as you've articulated there, we spend so much time thinking about what information do I want to share rather than what information do I want my audience to hear? Um, and then how do I get them to hear it? And how do I create those little information gaps that makes people intrigued to stay and actually listen? Because it's all, for me, the, the business presentation, and again, probably not the best for some presentations, but I sometimes look at business presentation a little bit by like um, a really bad movie that you can't turn the TV off. Because <laughs> yeah. you really... The, the movie's so bad, but you want to know the ending because they've teased you enough that there's an information gap that you just have to plug. So you sit through the world's worst movie just so you can go, I knew it, it was that person. And then you can turn it off and go to bed. But, but sometimes in business presentations, we forget to actually create that, that hook that gets the audience wanting to hear what you're going to say. Oh, and a, and a lot of these presentations are just terrible. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, you've seen these things, right? It, all this data, and you're like, "Where are we going?" I don't know, but it's really complicated data that I don't understand. And, and the meeting goes on and on. And but but then you're right, you 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 can't leave because you know you're worried that something's going to happen, or you're curious where this is all going to end up, or so you sort of have to pay attention to this terrible discussion. <laughs> and, and it's just a horrendous experience. And, 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 and a lot of good presenting goes back to thinking about your audience and yeah. thinking, about who are we presenting to? And what do they know? And what's going on in their life? And if you really think that through, what you very often you'll realize is that, you know, my audience is just zero. You know, they might, sometimes they just have zero interest in this topic. And they're there because they have to be there. And that's okay. I'm cool. But it's important to realize that. Other times you go in and you're like, you know, my audience is just going to hate my recommendation and they're not going to like it. And I got to figure out somehow to get them to like it. That's a very different kind of presentation. Or sometimes I'm going to go in there. I'm going to say, my audience is totally stressed right now. And I've got to go in there and reconnect with their stress, but then reassure them, give them a solution. If you really think through, think about that audience and build the presentation for them, it's going to change how you think about presentations and it's going to make them work a lot better. Yeah, for me, that what you've just articulated there is probably the most profound thing that listeners should take away from, from this discussion. Too many um, presenters are presenting with their ego at the forefront or, and their, their desire to demonstrate their intellect to the audience. Um, 
and again, I, a lot of times my, my boy's nine years old and I coach, I coach a lot of uh, sports. I coach hockey. Um, and a lot of times when I'm, we're preparing for the world cup in, in a couple of months time, and I even sit down with him and I, I try and I try and speak to him about what I'm about to talk to my players about. Cause I know if he can understand it, then I've got a really good chance that an international hockey player is going to understand it. Cause it's not about me demonstrating my knowledge to my son. It's about my son being able to understand the information I'm trying to share with him and him regurgitate it in a way that demonstrates understanding. Well, it probably is very similar. I, I had to guess as you, as you sort of say it, it's like, how do you, you know, as a coach, it's got to be interesting. How do you, it's like a marketing challenge and a communication challenge all wrapped up together. How do you get your players to understand what you're advising them and, and then to actually do it? And, you know, that's it. That's, that's, that's it. How do I, I want to convince my players to do a certain thing and how do I get them to do that? That's gotta, it's gotta be sort of a fun challenge, but I bet it's similar. Definitely. And it's, and again, it's like you said, it's about retention and it's about stories. One of, I love my favorite sporting movies is, is coach Carter. Um, and there's that bit where he's teaching them in, in basketball, their defensive strategies. And instead of giving them practical information, he tells stories about his ex-girlfriends and what they were like. And he uses those stories to dictate the kind of plays that they're going to do. And it, I just love that analogy because that's storytelling, that's presenting, that's, that's getting the audience to buy in to something that actually has feeling. And that, again, too many, too many presentations that I've, I've sat through, there is zero feeling um, in what you're actually being left with. It's just cold and dirty and horrible. And like you said, <laughs> you're almost left where you want to have a shower. Yeah. You feel so horrible at the end. Yeah, that's true. Well, and, and what's happening, I, I see too, is, is people are so uh, fascinated now by big data and analytics. And you've got to be just really careful because, you know, you can have all this big data and analytics and you can do all this cool regression work and multivariant regressions and stata and all, but, but your audience, you know, I promise you, they can't understand any of that. They don't follow any of that. Yeah. So if you just bring that to the presentation, you're really done, right? You, you've got to find a way to take all of that insight, which is great. It's great stuff, right? but turn it into something that your audience can follow and understand and track, make sense of. Otherwise, it's not going to have an impact. Yeah, so mastering the business presentation is, is mastering storytelling. It's, um, I think that's, um, it's definitely something I've taken out of this, this conversation so far. Um, but let, let's, let's just touch base a little bit on um, just some practical stuff for some sm small, small businesses um, around marketing questions. So what... What kind of what are the top two or three questions that you would advise um, small business owners to be thinking about as they go around building a and executing a marketing strategy? Oh, sure. So I would give you uh, I'd give you three questions. One question to think about, I think, is who is uh, my perfect uh, customer? And you know, the question is who is just the ideal client. So if I'm a if I'm a small accounting firm. Like, who's my perfect person, right? It's, you know, it's probably not GE or it's not Siemens or somebody like that. And it's probably not, you know, Tim Starda. It's like, who is the perfect person? And, mm -hmm. and people hate doing this, by the way, because they're like, who's your perfect customer? And they're like, you know, I love all my customers. <laughs> and if I could get everybody, that would be great. And, but that's not helpful. I mean, the question you got to really say, who is that person? And you want great clarity on that. And people talk about personas, and but I think great marketing starts from having a real clear sense of who do you want to who do you want to talk to. The second question then you you want to think about is, well, what's you know how, what what's a benefit that they care about and that I can help them achieve? Like what's important in their world that and what's something I can help them them achieve? So if I'm working with a you know if I'm working with a startup company for example, and I and I have a good sense that they are you know, really uh, overwhelmed with all the stuff they're working on. Well, all of a sudden, you know, maybe what I can do here is maybe I can help them uh, simplify their world because I can take on a lot of their stuff. And if I can help them simplify their world, that's going to let them focus on the things they got to focus on. And if they can focus on the things they can focus on, well, ultimately they can build their business, attract customers, maintain them. And, and if I can position it to get them to believe that, 
working with me is going to help them ultimately build their business in this. Then I've done it, right? Because I figured out the benefit that's really important. Mm. The third thing I think you've really got to think about is who are, who are the competitors out there and uh, what are they offering and where can I win versus the competitors? Uh, you know, I think often small companies, people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the competition. You know, big companies are often obsessed by the competition. Little companies, though, you know, there's so many things to worry about. The competitors sometimes don't show up at the top of the list. I think understanding your competitors is really important, partly because, you know, they're a threat and you've got to think about what are they doing and how is that hurting my business? How do I fight back? But the other thing is that your competitors are, you know, often they've got some good ideas. And if you want some good ideas, a simple way to get them is to go look at what are your competitors doing. Clearly, your competitors are. You have to assume smart people. And if they're doing it, they think it's a good idea. They might be onto something. And, mm. and so it's worth really studying your competitors. Think about what are they doing and what can I learn from it? And how am I going to win versus what they're doing? Yeah, it's interesting. As I, as I listen to your three questions, it's, it almost sums up a little bit of our, of our conversation. As I think about marketing and we always love adding complexity into everything we do. Um, and what we've talked about is in, in, in the book, How to Wash a Chicken, again, is the first thing you were talking about, and you used the phrase, my audience, on numerous occasions about understanding your target market, understanding your avatar, your ideal customer, understanding my, my audience. And, and again, you talked about competitors, which is distractions um, in, in, in consumers and clients. And a lot of what we've talked about really comes back to the fundamentals of, of marketing and again I think something that you've highlighted in your book and stuff which we will we'll, de- we'll share the, descri- the link to your your Amazon page for for the book in the description and again I think something like what you're talking about in how to wash chicken is is the real core practical steps of marketing because that's what business presentation is it's pure marketing it's storytelling right well it, it's true I think they're totally related someone said to me wow you know present a, a book on prison Presentations and presenting, that's a big change for you because I'm, I teach marketing. I'm a marketer at, at heart. But, but I, I would disagree. I mean, I think if you think about good communication in a, in a presentation, it is all about marketing. It, it's about how do we connect with our audience? How do we connect with our customer? How do we think about what they're interested in? Right? It's the same process mm. uh, you go through. It's thinking about who am I talking to? What's important to them? How am I going to connect with that? How am I going to tell a story then that will connect what I'm doing to what they're caring about? That's marketing and that's writing a great presentation. In a way, it is exactly the same thing, although people often don't think of it that way. Yeah, again, I look at it from a, from a personal point of view because as, as we started the conversation, um, we're marketing 24-7. Everything we do, we're marketing. We're marketing to our kids to get them to do their chores. And it's all about, and again, businesses, sometimes we forget in businesses, it's all about how we show up in everything we do, both physically, in the digital space, in all aspects, how are we showing up, how are we present in society as a reflection of our brand and our product. And that, and that's, that's, in, that's the core for me of marketing is how we show up. Oh, absolutely. Because what we know and what the data tells us is that people form opinions based on you know a, a amazing things and they form opinions very very quickly and it's often based on stuff we're not thinking about one of the studies i mentioned in the uh, in my book you know they did some research around uh, teachers and university teachers and uh, and what they did was an interesting study they they asked me they showed people little clips of a teacher and then they said how good a teacher do you think this teacher is and they compared it to what students said at the end of a uh, full semester. So after having spent 25, 30 hours with the teacher, they said, you know, how similar were these things? What they found, they first did it with, I believe it was a 30 second clip. And they found with a 30 second clip, you could basically figure out the end of the quarter uh, evaluations. And those were very highly correlated. Mm-hmm. And then they said, all right, let's trim it down to five seconds. Can we in five seconds figure out whether this is a good teacher? And what's amazing, yeah, they absolutely could because people pick up on everything, how you move, how you gesture, how you look. And when you realize that, all of a sudden it says, I've got to be thinking about marketing and how I'm communicating all the time. And I think that really is true. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great one for people to remember about, about impressions and, and showing up. Um, you mentioned clips. Um, one of the areas that you are known as, a, as an expert in is Super Bowl ads. Um, so which, which one is your favorite Super Bowl ad and, and what was it about that ad that makes it stand out for you? Well, we do uh, every year a big Super Bowl evaluation. We rate all the Super Bowl ads and we, and we look at what's, uh, what's worked and what hasn't worked. You know, there's so many uh, that have been wonderful over the years of, of, of Super Bowl spots. There's some just some terrific advertising on there, and there's some terrible advertising too. But if you want one, I would, I really love um, uh, a spot that was run by Google, actually. Uh, it's a spot that's called Parisian Love. And you can go Google it and find it, and uh, of course Google it. But anyway, you can you can find this ad. Uh, what was interesting about the spot, though, was that uh, that year nobody anticipated that Google was going to run an ad on the Super Bowl. So this was just a complete surprise. It ran on the game, and the ad is uh, this wonderfully simple ad. It, it's a story. And it's just a story that's told through a series of searches uh, on, on Google. And what's beautiful about it, though, is the ad demonstrated all the wonderful functionality that was embedded in Google. It was really just a product demonstration. But it, it did it with incredible branding. You knew exactly who it was for. And it did it in a context of a story that was heartwarming and engaging. It was really a beautiful spot because it really did what an ad needs to do. It got your attention. Uh, it, it made sure the brand came across and it communicated a benefit. And it did it by telling the story. And that was just a beautiful Super Bowl ad. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great way, again, just to, to bring everything together about very, very clear in terms of who it was targeting. It told a really warm and engaging story that, that remembered and, and demonstrated, as you said at the start, demonstrated the right benefits to its target market to hook them and get them engaged probably around their purpose again. Right. Absolutely. Because if you can really elevate it to those important benefits, again, you've done it. I mean, all of a sudden you've got, given people a reason to take action. You know, the problem is people aren't motivated very often by little features. They're motivated by things that are important to them. And that's the challenge. You know, how do you figure out what's important to them and how do you connect to it? That's true, whether you're selling a product or whether you're doing a presentation, it's still ultimately the same task. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're coming to the end of our time and I've got a couple of questions for you that I'm um, going to be fascinated by the, the answers. Um, All right, I'm ready. You're I'm ready. ready. You're feeling this one. <laughs> um, just first, just to warm you up a little bit, um, you've written a number of books um, which are giving people guidance on, on how to really make an impact in their business and in society with presentations, marketing plans. If you could write a book on absolutely anything, what would it be on? If I could write a book on absolutely anything. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you the book that I am, that I would like to write uh, next. Um, and I, maybe I'll start with that one, which is I would love to, so I, I, I love brands and I love learning about brands and seeing what happened to brands. And, and in the U.S., there was an interesting car brand that came on the market called Saturn. Uh, it was General Motors brand. And the book I would love to write is a history of Saturn and what happened to the brand. And, and the reason I think it's such an interesting topic is General Motors built this brand. It was a beautiful brand. They did wonderful advertising. They had a whole different model to working with employees and management and and, and it was a great story. And then it all fell apart. And I would love to lay out the story of what happened to that brand Saturn. Wonderful brand, great start, totally fell apart. That's a story I think that needs to be told. And hopefully I'll get around to that one at some point. Yeah, that'd be fascinating. Some of the GE's reputation at the moment is, is interesting. Um, just, and the final one is, um, what is the one question that you wished I had asked you. Uh, the one question uh, that you wished I had asked, well, I think you asked most of them. I mean, I guess they, I have a new book, so I guess you <laughs> could have asked, you know, why should somebody buy your new book? Um, uh, which would certainly be, a, that would certainly be an, 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 an easy one for me to address. That's probably it. But I think you've covered most of the topics there. 
Okay, well, let's address that one. Why should people? Let's address that question. Oh, that's easy. People <laughs> should buy that book because uh, to, to, to become a better uh, presenter. And the, the, the key thing to remember in the book is that if you present well, people are going to think that you're smart and you're strategic and you're gifted and you're talented and you're going to have an impact at work and you're going to get a promotion and you're going to get a bonus and you're going to have this wonderful career. If you can't present well, you're going to struggle on all those things. So it's really important to present well. The other thing, though, is that for me, when people think about presenting, they often think about how do you speak and do you say um a lot and do you look around the room and distract him. I don't worry about any of that stuff. For me, all of the work for a presentation should go on before you get to the room. Hmm. If you lay it out well, if it's clear, if you've got a story that makes sense, if you've connected in that story to what your audience is thinking about and caring about, if you started in a logical place, if it leads to the recommend, you know what? It's going to go fine. I don't care who presents it. I don't care how many times you say, um, it's going to go well. And with that in mind, it changes, I think, completely how you think about presentations. It's like, sure, I can do a great presentation because I can write that presentation and I can pre-sell it. I can take it and show it to people ahead of time. I can make sure I know all my numbers. When I get in there, it doesn't matter. You know, it's going to go well. And when you walk into a presentation knowing it's going to go well, you know what? It's going to go well and you're going to present it well. And you're not going to say, um, very much because you know what's happening and you want to get that story across and it's going to change how things go completely. Well, um, Professor Kalkin, thank you so much for sharing your insights. And thank you for, for what you're doing for society. Um, how you summarize that is you are giving every single person who has the ability to read or access your book the confidence to make a difference in their lives. Um, so many people are scared of taking that first step because they just don't feel they have the capabilities to go and, and sell their story, to market their story, to present their story. So I, I'd just like to thank you very much for giving, giving every single human being the opportunity to learn and get the confidence to, to make a difference in, in their world. Too many people are focused on uh, what, what's in it for, the, for them, what's in it for me. Um, uh, and you're very much focused in on giving to others to ensure others have control over their lives. So thank you very much for what you're doing for that. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your insights, um, wisdom and thoughts on, for me, the most important part of, of business. Well, thank you so much. This was really uh, super fun and it was a pleasure talking with you. And there you have it. What an amazing uh, interview between Mark and Professor Tim Culkins. I mean, how would you wash a chicken? Uh, certainly this is a podcast I will go back to and listen to again um, because marketing truly is one of the, if not the most important part of your business. Remember that if you know somebody who has a job, has a career and is looking to get promoted, send them to the link in the description below, uh, getpromoted.tetrakey.com, where they can go and learn the exact strategies that Mark used to 14x his salary and package in the corporate world across four continents in under 10 years. It's been a pleasure to serve you here today and remember... That if you wish to have success in your business life, you need to be a business revolutionary.